Hey guys, so welcome back for the crook discussion for the pharmacology questions. So let's start off from the 79th question. Let's see what is this. A patient ill with the collagenesis has been taking prednisolone for a long time. Okay. When he's taking prednisolone for a long time, what happens is that he develops something called hypokalemia. So cause the spastic pain of the skeletal muscles. What medication should be used in order to correct the potassium exchange? So guys, what is happening here? Let's see. Yes, he's taking a drug called as prednisolone. So when he's taking a drug called as prednisolone, what is this prednisolone? Guys, prednisolone is a drug which is called as glucocorticoid or corticosteroid. Are called as corticocorticosteroid. Now, what this corticosteroid does? See, guys, not just the mineralocorticoid, even glucocorticoids, all corticosteroids, they cause sodium water retention. Water retention. At the same time, they will also cause one more side effect that is potassium excretion excretion in the urine when potassium is excreted in the urine means the patient develops hypokalemia the patient develops hypokalemia now any patient who develops hypokalemia what is the treatment what is the treatment hypokalemia is treated with what potassium supplements potassium supplement now what is this potassium supplements potassium supplements are a combination of potassium containing drugs such as for example, we have a brand name drug, brand name drug named as Penangin. Penangin. Okay. Now, what is this Penangin? Guys, Penangin is a type of preparation which contains potassium and magnesium. Potassium and magnesium. So, what we do? He developed hypokalemia for the treatment of hypokalemia. We use what? Magnesium with potassium, or we can use pure potassium containing preparation. We can use pure potassium containing preparation. The brand name for this group of drug is called as Penangin. Okay, Chalo guys, let's go to the 80th question. A patient ill with essential hypertension was recommended a drug that prevents the thrombosis. So, he has a essential hypertension and he is at the risk of development of thrombosis. Thrombosis means a clot within the blood vessel. It is to be now for that thrombosis prevention, they gave a drug. It is to be taken paraenterally. What is the drug? Now, guys, see in this condition, what they ask in this condition among the given drugs, which is the drug which can be taken paraenterally at the same time, which drug is used for the prevention of thrombosis means which drug which can be taken paraenterally and which is used for prevention of thrombosis. So, among all the given drug, only heparin. Heparin is what? Heparin is an anticoagulant. Heparin is what? Heparin is an anticoagulant. Anticoagulant. So, what this anticoagulant does? This anticoagulant has something called as, it binds with, bind with someone called as antithrombin 3. Anti thrombin 3 now what is this antithrombin 3 doing antithrombin the name itself says it is inhibiting the activity of thrombin what is the use of thrombin thrombin is responsible for the clot formation now what happens this anticoagulant heparin which anticoagulant i'm talking here heparin now when heparin what happens it binds with antithrombin 3 and it increases its activity increase its activity when it increases its activity means there is no formation of clot because what is happening it is binding with antithrombin 3 and when it binds with antithrombin 3 it is increasing the activity of antithrombin 3 means antithrombin 3 is more active means thrombin is being inhibited thrombin is a clotting factor that is responsible for the clot formation so guys heparin is a anticoagulant what exactly it is doing it is binding with the antithrombin 3 and increasing the activity so it is a type of what type of anticoagulant it is a type of indirect anticoagulant indirect because it is not directly affecting the clotting factors but it is affecting the clotting factors indirectly right now apart from this we have one more mechanism of heparin the another mechanism of heparin which includes it inhibits the factor number two it inhibits the factor number two and ten of our clotting pathway if it is directly inhibiting the 
path clotting factor 2 and 10 even that is affecting as a anticoagulation so a heparin is a type of indirect and direct anticoagulant among those most important mechanism is indirect mechanism now it is a type of both indirect and direct because indirectly it increases the activity of antithrombinary but directly it is inhibiting the factor 2 and 10 but the same time what is the most important mechanism if somebody asks you you need to remember that will be indirect acting anticoagulant so this is story of our heparin and heparin is a type of substance which will be metabolized by gastric acid so we can never take it orally it is always given parenterally either subcutaneous or either intravenous route or as a intravenous route in heparin we have two types of heparin one of them is called as high molecular weight heparin and another one will be called as low molecular weight heparin now high molecular heparin can be given only intravenously Okay, now because of this intravenous administration of this high molecular weight heparin, we don't use it as a better drug. So for that purpose, we found out something called as low molecular heparin. Even low molecular weight heparin, even if I give subcutaneously, what will happen? The drug will get easily absorbed. For that purpose, the better used heparins are low molecular weight heparins. Low molecular weight heparin. Okay, now guys, a patient present with the twilight vision impaired impairment which of the following vitamin should be administered so if vision impairment is there what is the most important vitamin we need to look at always it is vitamin a vitamin a supplement is retinal acetate retinal acetate so this condition of vitamin a deficiency vitamin a deficiency what is this vitamin a deficiency guys let's look at little fact fat factors here vitamin a is a type of fat soluble vitamin it is responsible for vision it is responsible for vision when i'm speaking of vision if i have a deficiency if i have a deficiency it will lead to something called as nyctalopia it will lead to something called as nyctalopia nyctalopia means what it is type of night blindness nyctalopia nyctalopia is a night blindness that is a consequence of what that is a consequence of vitamin a deficiency later after nyctalopia it might even progress into something called as xerophthalmia Zero ophthalmia. If even after zero ophthalmia, it might even lead to corneal ulcer. It might lead to corneal ulcer. Corneal ulcer in the eye. This is the story of our 81st question. Let's go to the 82nd question. When I'm speaking of 82nd question, let's see what it is. A female patient consulted a doctor about the pain and limited movements in the knee joints. Which of the following non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug should be administered taking into consideration that the patient has a history of chronic gastroduodenitis? Guys, for this one, I will give a brief picture, but if you don't know the full concept of this one, there is a video on my channel which is uh, on the topic of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. For the croak exam, it's so, so important topic. Please do watch that. It will be helpful for you. But anyways, I'm going to talk about this question. Now, what happens, guys? We have something called as arachidonic acid. This arachidonic acid will be metabolized by one of the important pathways, that is COX pathway. COX has two types, COX-1 and COX-2. COX-1 is responsive, is present in physiological condition. So physiological condition means what? Physiological in normal condition also COX-1 is present. COX-1 is present but COX-2. COX-2 is activated only during what? Only during a inflammation. Inflammation. When COX gets activated, this COX-2 which gets activated, it will produce prostaglandins. These prostaglandins which are abnormal, which are leading to what? Fever. Which are leading to fever, pain fever, pain and the inflammation itself, the inflammation itself. But COX-1 in a physical, in a normal person, what COX-1 is doing? COX-1 is protecting the stomach. COX-1 is protecting the stomach. Okay. Now what we have, we have some group of drugs named as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. What these are non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs? Guys, these are the group of drugs. They inhibit cox enzyme these are the drugs they inhibit cox enzyme but look here look here in physiologically in normal condition i have cox so it is doing some protecting activity what exactly it is doing the protecting activity it is protecting the stomach yes or no once it is protecting the stomach means if i inhibit cox if i inhibit cox 1 there is no protection to the stomach but if i inhibit cox 2 no inflammation pain and 
fever. So what is my target by giving this drug? By giving this drug, I need to decrease the pain, fever and inflammation. For that purpose, I use I should use only COX-2 inhibitor. But the NSAIDs usually inhibit COX-1 and 2 both. COX-1 and 2 both. Now what I need to have? I need to have, for example, any, I, I will lose the protection of stomach. I will lose the protection of stomach. What will happen if I inhibit one and two both? What will happen here? So no protection of stomach. No protection of stomach means it might lead to ulcer. It might lead to ulcer. Means if I have a patient who is already having some peptic ulcer, means I cannot use this COX-1 and 2 inhibitor. So I need to use a selective COX inhibitor. Selective COX-2 inhibitor because COX-2 is the culprit. So selective COX-2 inhibitor is that drug that is selecoxib is what? Selecoxib. Now selecoxib is what? Apart from this selecoxib, every other COX-2 inhibitor ends with coxib, selecoxib, rafecoxib, itrocoxib. So all these coxibs are the selective COX-2 inhibitors. They are selected in a patient who is already having some problem in the stomach. In the stomach, no, we cannot give the COX-1 and 2 inhibitor. We can use only COX-2 inhibitor. This is the theory. But so this is a long topic. Please do watch that video and learn the full topic behind this. Okay. Oh, let's go to the next question. Now, guys, see. <clears throat> a 66 year old female patient got intravenous injection of magnesium okay she got a intravenous injection of magnesium sulfate solution for the purpose of elimination of hypertensive crisis okay but arterial pressure did not go down so blood pressure did not go down okay and after repeated induction of the same preparation there appeared a sluggishness slow response inhibition of con consciousness respiration what preparation is the antagonist of magnesium sulfate can eliminate the symptoms overdose. So guys, let's learn a little bit about magnesium sulfate here. So guys, when I'm speaking of MgSO4, that is our magnesium sulfate. Guys, what happens? Magnesium sulfate when given intravenously, when given intravenously, it will cause what? It will decrease the BP. It will decrease the BP. But why decrease the BP? So we need to know the mechanism of action of magnesium. Magnesium, it is very simple thing. Antagonize calcium. Antagonize calcium. Once it antagonizes calcium, means what? Calcium is not there. If means calcium activity is decreased, means that will lead to what? If calcium is present, it will lead to vasoconstriction. But if I antagonize, means block the activity of calcium, that will lead to vasodilation. But not just the vasodilation. If I give more dose of more dose of so magnesium SO4, that is. Or magnesium sulfate during overdose during overdose what it leads to it leads to vasodilation pp decrease but apart from that it will lead to loss of reflexes loss of muscle reflexes muscle reflexes and what else it will lead to even it will lead to muscle weakness Muscle weakness, once it leads to muscle weakness, respiratory muscles undergo paralysis, the patient's breathing might stop. Now guys, look here, magnesium antagonize calcium, means calcium will antagonize magnesium, calcium antagonize magnesium, so overdose, during a overdose of a magnesium, the antidote for magnesium overdose will be calcium, antidote will be calcium. What is the form of calcium which we get for the using of intravenous most commonly used is calcium gluconate, calcium gluconate. So antidote for calcium overdose will be magnesium, magnesium overdose will be calcium. This is the story of our calcium magnesium game. Okay, chalo, we already discussed the 84th question just some time ago. Now let's go to the 85th question. A patient underwent appendectomy. Okay, so a patient underwent appendectomy. All right. In the post-operative period, means after the surgery, he had been taking an antibiotic. Okay, he was given obviously after post uh, post surgically during this post-operative period, we do give antibiotics to prevent the any other infections from happening. The patient complains about hearing impairment. So we and vestibular disorder what group of antibiotics guys this is a direct thing always remember one of the most important group of antibiotics which causes which causes ototoxicity aminoglycosides aminoglycosides they cause ototoxicity 
Now, what is this ototoxicity? They are toxic to our inner ear. They are toxic to our inner ear. So, what are these amino glycoside the drugs such as gentamicin? Gentamicin. We have one more drug, for example, canamycin. Canamycin. And remember, we have one important anti TB drug. One anti TB drug, which is also under this amino glycoside. That is our streptomycin. That is our streptomycin. Streptomycin is anti TB drug, but which belongs to which group of antibiotic? It belongs to a group of antibiotic. They are called as amino glycoside. What these amino glycosides? They are toxic to the inner ear, causing the hearing impairment so once it came about the ototoxicity let's see the other drugs other drugs which cause ototoxicity the most important other group of drugs which cause ototoxicity which you need to remember are are loop diuretics are loop diuretics loop diuretics okay so this is a story of our amino glycoside let's go to the next question if Student came to see doctor. A student came to see the doctor. Okay, and asked to administer him a drug for the treatment of allergic rhinitis that occurred in the period of lightning floss. What drug may be used? Guys, he's a student. If he's a student, he needs attention. He needs attention. Okay, let's see. If he is having an allergy for allergy, what is the treatment, guys? We use antihistamines. Anti histamines okay so when i use antihistamines antihistamines are divided into two groups first generation and second generation guys the few people say there is something called third generation exists but according to the textbooks the classic reference textbook they nowhere say that there is third generation antihistamines the feed drugs which people put into the third generation they belong to again they are what they belong to just second generation according to the classic textbook so i'd like most of the students, I advise to follow the classic textbook. Antihistamines has only two generations. Okay. Now, what is this first generation? First generation, they can cross, they can cross blood-brain barrier. If these can cross the blood-brain barrier, guys, this first, they need drug. If it is crossing the blood-brain barrier, any drug which is crossing the blood-brain barrier means they block the histamine receptor. They block the histamine receptor in brain also in brain also when they block histamine receptor in the brain they will lead to sedation sedation but in second generation they do not cross they no crossing of they have no crossing of blood brain barrier if they don't cross the blood brain barrier means what guys they don't have no sedation so in a patient, in a person who is having allergy and if you decided to give antihistamines of second generation, antihistamines of second generations, so they don't cross the blood brain barrier. That is why we need to give them in a people who needs attention. So now one of the most important drug which is present in the list of antihistamines in the second generation is loratadine. Apart from that, we have one more drug called as desloratadine, desloratadine and we have one more drug called as citrusin citrusin and we have one more drug called as levo citrusin levo citrusin all right so this is a story of our 86 question now let's move on to the next question that is 87 a seven year old child is ill with bronchitis okay is it with bronchitis all right it is necessary to administer him an antibacterial drug what drug of fluoroquinolone group guys they already asked which of the follow so, what drug of fluoroquinolone group is contraindicated? Means you need to find out which of the following drug is a fluoroquinolone. Guys, fluoroquinolones are the group of drugs. They are what? They end with floxacin. They end with mostly floxacin. Fluoroquinolones include cipro, floxacin, moxy, floxacin, levo, floxacin. Levo, floxacin. Now, all this belong to fluoroquinolone group. They inhibit, they work by action of inhibiting one enzyme. They inhibit what? They inhibit an enzyme called as DNA gyrase. DNA gyrase. Now, DNA gyrase inhibition of what? Of bacteria. When they inhibit DNA gyrase of the bacteria, what will they cause? They will stop the 
replication of the DNA in the bacteria. That's how they work as an antibiotic and the drugs include ciprofloxacin, moxifloxacin and levofloxacin. Among these things guys, <coughs> when you need to understand something in here, we have something called as res respiratory fluoroquinolone and a kidney fluoroquinolone. So in kidney infection, the fluoroquinolone which is used is in kidney, if they ask you which fluoroquinolone, please note this, in kidney infection, which fluoroquinolone is better, that will be ciprofloxacin. In lung infection, which fluoroquinolone is better, that will be levofloxacin. Levofloxacin. So levofloxacin is what? Better for lung infection. Among, if they ask you flu, which fluoroquinolone, in that case you need to select levofloxacin for lung infection, ciprofloxacin for kidney infection. So this is the story of our 87th question. Let's move on to the next question. So that will be 88th question. Now guys, here it is a direct question they asked you. What they asked you? A child has a dry cough. Dry cough means we need to treat them. If we need to treat them, we use a group of drug called as antitussives. Antitussives. When I am speaking of antitussives, they are what? Anti-cough drugs. Anti-cough drugs. So when I am speaking, they are anti-cough drugs, right? Now let's look at these things, guys. Anti-cough drugs. In a broad picture, I can divide them into opiates. Opiates. What are these opiates? They are also called as narcotic agents. Narcotic agents. When I am speaking of non-opiates non opioids okay in non opioids the anti tussive drug one of the most important drug is glossine hydrochloride glossine hydrochloride and they asked you non narcotic anti tussive drug should be used for example if they asked you opioid drug that will be codeine that will be codeine so opioids which can be used as an anti tussive drug is codeine codeine because codeine will suppress the cough center in suppress the cup center but we'll remember one thing opiates in large dose they directly suppress even your respiratory center even your respiratory center now guys a patient has been diagnosed with a transmural myocardial infraction any patient who has a transmural myocardial infraction what is the most important problem the patient will have pain the patient will have pain okay what drug should be administered in order to prevent the cardiogenic shock now guys understand one thing Pain is not just a problem in myocardial infraction. In apart from myocardial infraction, the, apart from the pain, the patient will have an acute heart failure. Acute heart failure. Why acute heart failure? Some part of the myocardium is dead. Heart is unable to pump properly. If the patient develops acute heart failure, the patient will have two things. The patient will have one of them is shock. The another one will be pulmonary edema. Another will be pulmonary edema. So for this purpose, I need to stop. I need to stop the load on the heart and I need to decrease the pain. So which drug should be used in this condition? That will be, we choose opioids to decrease the pain. Opioids to decrease the pain. And opioids to decrease the pain, not just pain, but we need to decrease the load on the heart means I need to decrease the sympathetic activity. Opioids do what? Opioids decrease the sympathetic outflow. Sympathetic outflow. So I choose opioids to decrease the pain and the sympathetic outflow at the same time. Now one of the most important opioids which we use in myocardial infraction is morphine. Morphine. If I don't have morphine, I choose tremadol. Tremadol. Okay. Now, what is this? Promedol. Guys, remember, in most of the past USSR countries, means in the old USSR countries, they have this opioid called as Promodol. That is what will be used. It is considered to be better drug. It is considered to be better drug in few countries when compared to morphine. Even than morphine, they would prefer this drug. So that's why you need to remember this fact. That is the Promodol. Okay. Chalo. Now let's go to the next question. When I'm speaking of 90th question, a patient consulted a physician about muscle rigidity. Okay, he has muscle rigidity. Okay, constrained movements, permanent arm tremor. The patient was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. Okay, doctor diagnosed him with Parkinson's disease. Now, guys, when I'm speaking of Parkinson's disease, Parkinson's disease, guys, see, I'm just giving a overview here. If you want to learn more about all anti Parkinson's drugs, there is one more video on my channel which you can find. So, most of the topics which you can find on my channel, please do watch it if you need them. Okay, now when I'm speaking of Parkinson's disease, it is simplified as 
decrease of dopamine, decrease of dopamine, where decrease of dopamine in in substantial in substantia substantia nigra. Okay. Now when there is a decrease of dopamine in the substantia nigra, I need to give a preparation which contains dopamine. I need to contain send the preparation that is dopamine. For example, I gave IV dopamine. IV dopamine. Now, but what is the problem? The problem is that this is central nervous system. This is central nervous system. But central nervous system means if I give dopamine, dopamine if it reach the, if it should reach the central nervous system needs to cross the blood brain barrier. Need to cross the BPB. Need to cross the BPB. But, but the problem is that dopamine cannot cross the blood brain barrier. Dopamine cannot cross the blood brain barrier. If dopamine cannot cross the blood brain barrier, I need to give some drug which can cross the blood brain barrier and get converted into dopamine in the central nervous system. So I will give something called as levodopa. Levodopa. Levodopa cross the blood brain barrier. Easily cross the blood brain barrier. Easily and it will reach the central nervous system. But it is given intravenously, for example, or it is given orally. It is given orally. When I give this drug intravenously or orally, it is reaching the peripheral tissues also. So I need to understand here, guys. See, let's make out in this simple diagram. Now, this is my central nervous system. Okay. This is my blood brain barrier. Now, here I have levodopa. levodopa. Now, what happens? Levodopa cross the blood brain barrier and go. But at the same time, in the periphery where I gave the drug, we have some enzyme called as dopa decarboxylase. Now, dopa decarboxylase will break this, break the drug. Means if it break the drug, not much drug will reach the central nervous system. So now what I need to do? I need to block this enzyme dopa decarboxylase. Which dopa decarboxylase? Peripheral. Peripheral. So peripheral dopa decarboxylase inhibitor is carpi dopa. Carpi dopa. Now what is carpi dopa? Carbidopa is a peripheral, peripheral dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. Dopa decarboxylase inhibitor. So carbidopa will has no crossing of, do not cross, do not cross blood brain barrier. Only drug with the carbidopa and levodopa. Only levodopa cross the blood brain barrier. Carbidopa do not cross the so with these things, we are done with the 90th question. Let's go to the next question. Okay. A patient takes digoxin for the treatment of cardiac insufficiency. What diuretic may increase the digoxin toxicity? Now, what diuretic will increase the digoxin toxicity is our question, right? Guys, we need to understand what precipitates the digoxin toxicity. So for that purpose, we need to know mechanism of action of digoxin. Mechanism of action of Detox. Now, when I'm speaking of mechanism of action of detoxin, guys, if I take this as one cardiomyocyte, if I take this as a site as one cardiomyocyte, and every cell of our body, on human body, every cell, we have some pump called as sodium potassium ATPS. ATPS. Now, what happens? Usually, there is some sodium which will be coming out of the cell and potassium will be going into the cell into the cell with the help of ATP okay so this is how after see during depolarization what happens sodium comes inside the cell for example during so depolarization sodium comes inside the cell inside the cell sodium keeps increasing but that has to be maintained who will maintain that that will be maintained by the sodium potassium ATPs now what the sodium potassium ATPs is doing sending out the sodium and taking the potassium now what happens our detoxin our drug detoxin will bind to this site, will bind to this site and block this site. Means, digoxin bind to which site? Potassium site. Means, digoxin, digoxin competes, competes for what? Competes for, competes for potassium site. Competes for potassium site. It competes for the potassium site. Means, have one site for that, potassium is also want to Digoxin also want to buy. Digoxin also want to buy. That is our potassium site. Okay. 
Now what happens with this? Guys, if I don't have potassium, if I don't have potassium, digoxin will bind stronger. Digoxin will bind stronger. When digoxin binds stronger, the activity of digoxin will be increased. The activity of digoxin will be increased. Okay. So by this logic, digoxin toxicity is precipitated by hypokalemia. Hypokalemia. So hypokalemia is what? Hypokalemia is a precipitating factor precipitating factor for the digoxin toxicity but who will cause hypokalemia one of the most important drugs that is our diuretics diuretics so among the given drugs which one of the following groups cause hypokalemia hypokalemia will be caused by hydrochlorothiazide it is a type of thiazide diuretic thiazide diuretic but you might have a question why not spironolactone spironolactone is a diuretic but spironolactone is a type of potassium sparing diuretic. If it is a potassium sparing diuretic, means it is doing what? It is saving the potassium inside the body. So it is not causing the hypokalemia. It is not causing the hypokalemia. So that is why the answer would be hydrochlorothiazide. So always remember hypokalemia, which drugs you should always recall two group of drugs. One of them is thiazide diuretics. The other one will be loop diuretics. Loop diuretics. These two groups cause what? Hypokalemia as a side effect. When there is a hypokalemia, what happens? Digoxin, if for that person, if he get, takes digoxin also, then digoxin toxicity will be precipitated. Digoxin toxicity will be precipitated. This is the story of our 91st question. Let's go to the 92nd question. When I'm speaking of 92nd question, a patient with the coronary artery disease. So I have a patient which, who is having what? Who is having a coronary artery disease. All right, let's see what will happen. Was admitted to the cardiological department for the stenocardia prevention. A drug from the group of beta adrenoreceptor blocker was administered. What is this drug? So they are told you among the given drugs, which of the following is beta blocker? Among the given drug, the drug which is beta blocker, that will be metoprolol. So remember, every lol, every lol is a beta blocker. Every lol is a beta blocker. Now, beta types of beta blocker will keep changing. The which blocks which one means. So there are few drugs which blocks beta one blocker. There are few drugs which blocks beta two, beta one and two receptor. There are few drugs which blocks alpha and beta receptor. The story is every if any drug ending with lol, the in inhibits beta receptor that inhibits of blocks beta receptor now why i have already discussed this question already in the earlier parts of the video let's go to the next question guys remember if a patient is having a pulmonary tb pulmonary tb what you need to give anti tb drugs anti tb drugs are anti tb treatment anti tb treatment what is this drug the drugs in the first line include iso niacid iso niacid Rifampicin. Rifampicin. Now we have ethambutol. Ethambutol. Butol. Pyrazinamide. 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 And we have one more drug that is streptomycin. Streptomycin. Now, guys, remember there are few important things. Isoniazid. Isoniazid is a drug that will cause something called. Optic neuritis, optic neuritis. Okay, so this is a side effect caused by isoniazid. When I'm speaking of rifampicin, rifampicin causes the red color body fluids. Red color body fluids. What are the red color body fluids? It will turn saliva, urine, and tears. All of them into which color? Into a red color. All of them into which color? Into red color. Into red color. Now, streptomycin, I already discussed. It causes phototoxicity. When I'm speaking of ethambutal, it causes hyperuricemia as a side effect. So, you need to remember these facts. Streptomycin, phototoxicity, rifampicin, red color body fluids, isoniazid, abstract neuritis. At the same time, isoniazid even causes hepatotoxicity. Hepatotoxicity. Okay, chalo, let's go to 95th question. A patient was with, ill with amoebiasis. So I already discussed in the first part of the video only the TB. That means in the part one video only. In the, in the amoebiasis, the drug of choice would be metronidazole. Okay, so prescribed a certain drug. The use of the alcohol together with this drug contraindicated because it inhibits the mechanism of ethyl alcohol. What drug it is? Yes, remember one thing. One thing that is alcohol. 
ethyl alcohol. Now, when a person drinks ethyl alcohol, that will be metabolized by an enzyme called as alcohol dehydrogenase. Alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, when alcohol dehydrogenase works, that will lead to acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde. Okay, now acetaldehyde. What will happen? Acetaldehyde will be metabolized by acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. Now, what happens is that most of our antibiotics have a tendency to block this enzyme, leading to acetaldehyde accumulation. When acetaldehyde accumulates in the body, the patient will become sick, such as vomiting, nausea, irritability will be happened. But we have one more drug that is disulfuram. That is what disulfuram. Disulfuram also does what? Disulfuram. Disulfuram also inhibits this enzyme. This enzyme means the reaction caused by the disulfuram. Uh, <coughs> the reaction caused by the disulfuram is aversion to the alcohol by increasing the acetaldehyde in a human body. At the same time, there are few antibiotics. That is one of the most important important drug is metronidazole which will cause something called as disulfuram like reaction disulfuram like reaction so if you prescribe any of your patients metronidazole please advise them not to have alcohol during this period okay now remember guys let's go to the ninth sixth question any patient comes to you with a chronic heart failure one of the most important drug which should be given as cardiac glycoside is cardiac glycoside glycoside so the drug of choice for a chronic heart failure will be cardiac glycoside which cardiac glycoside drug cardiac glycoside will be digoxin that will be digoxin okay now what is this digoxin guys let me speak about little bit about digoxin right when i'm speaking of digoxin guys in a cardiac myocyte what happens is that during depolarization sodium enters inside the cell after end result will be calcium, calcium cause contraction, blah, 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 story we have. But remember here, calcium cause, there is a big video about the heart failure in my channel. Please go to watch that one because I cannot discuss the full theory here. I'm just going to overview. Now, what will happen? Calcium causes contraction. That is the one fact I want people to remember with that fact. Let's move on. Now, what happens? There is one pump that is sodium potassium now this sodium potassium ATPS is doing kicking out sodium taking in potassium okay now what happens if I block this pump sodium will be increased inside the cell when sodium increased inside the cell there are special pumps which are bi-directional pumps means two directional pumps they are sodium calcium exchangers they are called as sodium calcium exchangers now what will happen if I have more sodium if I have more sodium inside the cell sodium will go out take the calcium and calcium will lead to contraction leading the cardiac activity now when i'm speaking of digoxin digoxin is a type of what digoxin is a type of cardiac glycoside which blocks the sodium potassium atps but what other factors which we need to remember about the digoxin the most important factors it will cause something called as accumulation 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 what is this accumulation means drug will get sick accumulated in the body and which if not gets excreted properly that will lead to drug accumulation causing the overdose or a toxicity one of the most important symptoms of digoxin toxicity include bradycardia extracystals nausea vomiting and even diarrhea and the visual symptoms <coughs> and the visual symptoms are the few symptoms about what about accumulation of the digoxin one of the most important side effect caused by digoxin so let's see a patient deal with a chronic cardiac insufficiency was prescribed a therapeutic dose of digoxin two weeks after he began of it taking there appeared a symptom of drug intoxication name the phenomenon the phenomenon behind this will be material means drug accumulation material accumulation it is a type of drug accumulation drug accumulation now guys let's look at the next question 98 question 98 question a patient with the drug intoxication prescribed with a presented with the patient presented with dryness of the oral mucous membrane and midriatic pupils dryness of the mucous membrane and midriatic pupil action of such drugs so they are telling what they are telling 
Midriatic, midriatic, pupil, midriatic, pupil. At the same time, the patient is having what? Dryness of the mouth. Okay. So, midriasis. Midriasis along with xerostomia. Xerostomia. So, midriasis and xerostomia, they are the symptoms of sympathetic activity. Sympathetic activity. When I'm speaking of sympathetic activity, sympathetic activity can be produced by two ways. One of them is block parasympathetic. Block parasympathetic. Or, or we can do one more thing. Stimulate sympathetic. Stimulate sympathetic. Now, guys, we need to understand one thing here. But when I'm speaking of xerostomia, xerostomia means dry mouth, right? In the mouth, secretion, secretion is based on secretion is based on what cholinoreceptor cholinoreceptor when i'm speaking of cholinoreceptor cholinoreceptor is a type of parasympathetic receptor now if i block this cholinoreceptor secretion is blocked secretion is blocked means xerostomy the only possibility for the developing xerostomia is what blocking of cholinoreceptor now which cholinoreceptor present in the mouth that will be muscarinic cholinoreceptor muscarinic cholinoreceptor this is the story of our 98th question 98th question okay a patient with ischemic heart disease has been administered an anti angina drug that reduces the myocardial oxygen consumption and increases the blood flow so guys look at this question they are directly saying the oxygen consumption is decreased and improves the blood flow who will improve the blood flow to the heart the blood flow to the heart is improved by nitroglycerin if you don't know how it happens that is even nitroglycerin causes vasodilation causes vasodilation by producing a substance called as NO by producing a substance called as NO it causes vasodilation right when there is a vasodilation where exactly vasodilation is happening with nitroglycerin nitroglycerin more predominantly first target will be what in the coronary circulation in coronary circulation it causes vasodilation and improves the blood flow improves the blood flow this is a story of our 99th question 99th question now guys the 100th question one word is enough to understand penetral penetral is a first generation antihistamine if it is a first generation antihistamine the most important side effect caused by this penetral drug would be sedation 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 to fall asleep okay now let's see a patient with insomnia is having a insomnia means is unable to sleep and he is having an allergic crash now if we need to treat this condition if i need to treat this condition i need to use a drug which causes sleep at the same time which decrease the allergy so i told you the allergy decrease as well as sleep induction is caused by antihistamine first generation if i need a person to be awake means if i need my patient to have proper attention towards his daily activity or if he needs more attention that conditions we use antihistamines of first second generation second generation so that they won't cross the blood brain barrier and they do not cause sedation as side effect but when i'm speaking of if i have a person with insomnia that person needs to sleep if he needs to sleep we need to have a drug which induces the sleep that the induction of the sleep is done by first gen antihistamine that will be our sedation that will be our sedation again 101st question we already discussed this depolarizing myorelax and these are the group of drugs they work for a short period of time they work for a short period of time the most important depolarizing myorelax is dithrinum which you need to remember so this <clears throat> this is a story of our 100 and till 101st question let's continue in the next upcoming videos from 102 to the end okay